Chapter 27. What if he shoots us, Moon? He won't shoot us even if we let him see us. He's too tired to hit anything he aims at. How are you going to whip up on a full-grown policeman? We'll have to trap him. Kate groaned to himself as he walked back to the ridge where I'd last seen Sanders. My mind raced with ideas as to how I would trap something so large. I imagined pits being dug, trees bent over with snare loops, logs made into deadfalls. You know, you can't kill him, Moon. I won't kill him, Kate. I never killed anybody. I don't see why we had to do anything to him. I say we just run. I'm not running from him anymore. We reached the top of the hill, and I told Kit to crawl beside me on his stomach. We wiggled up to the edge so that we could see down into the valley where Sanders fell. I listened for a few minutes and didn't hear anything. You think he's hurt? Maybe. What if he's hurt? Well, then we'll hog tie him and think of some way to get him out of here. You can't tie him up. Shh. Yes, I can. Pat let me practice on him before. Kit groaned again. Picked up a rock and lobbed it down into the trees below. We listened after it, but heard nothing. If we just leave, then maybe he'll never find us. I stood up. Yeah, but we won't get his gun either. What? His gun? Kit stood up and began to walk back the way we'd come. Hey, I said, where are you going? I'm not taking the policeman's gun, Moon. I ran after him and caught his shoulder. We've got to have a gun kit. We can't make it in Alaska without a gun. He kept walking. Kit, don't leave me, I pleaded. Kit stopped and stared at the moon. Why do you have to mess with him, moon? Because I need that pistol. He took my rifle from me. What about your bow? That bow won't be near as good in Alaska, even with the deer sinew on it. What about your pap's rifle? I don't know how to get back to our old shelter. Kit sighed and looked at me. It'll be all right? Yeah, I assured him. I don't want to get shot. Don't worry, we'll trap him good. He won't get shot. I told Kit to take off his shoes so we could walk quieter. We slipped through the forest until I heard Sanders moan. I looked back at Kit and raised my hand so he would hold still while I moved closer. He nodded and I turned in my feet so that I stood on only the outside edges of them. After getting my bearings, I began to lift and place them slowly into the leaves, watching where each foot went. I ducked under branches and twisted around bushes like someone in slow motion. When I had traveled about 50 yards, I saw movement ahead of me. I stepped sideways to put a large tree between myself and whatever it was. I looked back to check on Kit, but I couldn't see him through the brush. Sanders moaned again, and I felt my neck hairs rise. I reached the tree and peered around it. Sanders was lying on his back next to Deer Creek. His eyes were closed, and his stomach heaved up and down. His clothes were torn and muddy and grass-stained from where he'd been sliding and rolling down the hills. He was covered with scrapes, and a t-shirt that he had been using to clean them was beside him, stained with blood. He still had his gun belt on, and the pistol was snapped into the holster. I stayed between behind the tree for a few minutes, listening to him breathe and trying to figure out how to get the pistol. Once again, I imagined snares and pits and rope swings and giant crashing logs. It wasn't long before I had the perfect plan in my head. I turned around carefully and slowly made my way back. Kit and I returned to the top of the ridge about 200 yards down the valley. We then made our way to the creek again, where it ran swift between steep banks. I found two long pieces of wisteria vine and worked with them for a while before Kit spoke. What are you going to do? He asked. Snare him. How? I pointed at the large log lying a few feet away. Roll that over the here, I told him. We got behind the log and began pushing it towards me. We made a lasso out of one of the vines and placed it in a deer trail that ran the edge of the creek. I tied the other end of the lasso to one end of the log. Finally, I, I took the other vine and tied it to the log as well. The two of us got under the log. With all of our strength, we stood it up against a tree near the creek edge, with the end I had tied the vines to in the air. I pointed to some bushes a few yards off the deer trail. You get in those bushes, I told Kit. When Sander trips on that lasso loop, you jerk hard on the other vine. Kit stared at me blankly. It'll work, I reassured him. Just pull hard. I grabbed the end of the vine, pull vine, and put it in his hand. 
I'm going to get him. I'll be back in a minute. Kate groaned and tightened his hands. Xander was still sound asleep. Picked up a stick and poked him in the stomach. He didn't wake, but his hand came up and slapped at his side. I poked him again. This time his eyes opened and he stared at the treetops. Sanders, I said. Huh? It's Moon. Suddenly his eyes flashed in my direction. His face shot flame red and veins stood like tent ropes under his skin. Ah, he yelled. He rolled over and began to run towards me on his knees with his hands out in front. I turned and ran down the deer, down the deer trail. Boy, you better stop right here. You're dead, kid. I slowed after about a hundred yards and zigzagged and ducked easily along the deer trail. I heard Sanders crashing through the forest like a wild hog, and I imagined the stickers tearing into him. I jogged past Kit and looked at his wide eyes in the brush. Get ready, I said. Here he comes. When Kit pulled the vine, I was crouched down the trail where I could see everything, but not so close that I couldn't stand and lead Sanders away from Kit if things went wrong. Sanders tripped over the raised lasso and fell heavily into the leaves, just as I'd planned. The giant log slipped off the tree and went crashing into Deer Creek below, jerking the lasso right around Sanders' ankles. His legs were yanked so hard that he spun around like a compass needle. He tore chunks of bushes and grass from the ground as the log pulled him towards the creek bank. Finally, he managed to grab a small clump of bushes that held, and he rolled over onto his stomach. The log bobbed and swayed in the creek, ready to pull him with it if he let go. I came running back into the trail until I was standing over him. He glanced at me briefly and then looked at his hands holding a bush. I whipped you good this time, I said. All he could do was yell, ah! I bent over and I snapped his holster. I took the pistol out and jabbed it in my pocket. I'd be fine if you hadn't taken all my things, I said. Kill you, he gasped. I stared at him suddenly. I felt myself getting angry again. I'll kill you, I screamed. You took me away to Pinson. Leave us alone. Moon, Kit yelled. I stood there breathing heavily. Moon, he yelled again. I looked over at him. Come on, he begged. Chapter 28 I told Kit that we had to wait a while before we shot the pistol, just in case there were more people out in the woods looking for us. You think it's loud, he asked me. It's going to be loud. I've never seen a pistol this big. You don't think he'd drown, do you? No, once these vines get some slack, they'll spring loose. I'll bet he went riding down that creek a ways, though. I don't want him messing with me anymore, Kit. Do you think he found his way out yet? If you walk that creek, he's bound to hit a road eventually. Or floats down it. That too, he said. Kit sighed. This is crazy, Moon. I bet he's going to have a whole police department after us. O'Brigan from jail said he didn't have any friends. Maybe we should start walking towards Alaska soon. I shook my head. It's too cold up there right now. We'd do best to wait until spring. Stay here in a shelter as long as we can. Teach you more stuff. Over the next two weeks, we made improvements to the walls of the shelter, piling on more pine balls and anything we could find that kept off rain. Even though the venison seemed like it would last until spring, I made snares and deadfalls in the forest that brought us rabbits, possums, and a few raccoons. The deer sinew was dry and cured. I twisted it into a thin cord and strung the bow with it. I finished it out by wrapping the handle with deer skin and carved a small channel for the air shaft. Outside of patching our shelter, making weapons and checking traps, there was still time to play. I made a vine swing across Kit Creek and stacked a mound of pine straw and magnolia leaves to land on. We made flutter mills out of the twigs and leaves and had contests to see who would last the longest. Kit liked these things, and it didn't take much of them to get his mind off Sanders. On some nights, we lie up on the lookout platform and stare at the stars. Kit smiled when I talked of the fun we would have when spring came. How the creeks warmed and we could make spears and swim down in the clear water looking for bass and bream. I bought Alaska. We'll load up on food and then we'll head out. We can't leave for Alaska without plenty of supplies. I told them how we could boil blackberries in the can to make syrup or pour our over acorn cakes. I told them of catching frogs as big as our feet and of lying on our backs in kudzu with a full vine of honeysuckle and fresh eggs from duck nests that I would cook with bacon from a wild hog I would kill. The only night sounds that came to our ears were from owls and coyotes. Occasionally we heard a bobcat. Sometimes we heard sounds that I couldn't figure out. And I told 
Kit about the time Pap had seen the Bigfoot in Montana. Kit got scared about the Bigfoot until he told him that there weren't any in Alabama. I slept with the pistol beside me. Almost every night, I would take it from under the marsh grass and turn it over in front of my face. The writing on it was the only thing I had to read, so I memorized the make and model and serial number. Colts, P-T-F-A-M-F-G-C-O. Hartford, Connecticut, USA, United States property. Model of 1911 U.S. Army, number 445309. One morning, Kid asked me if he could hold the pistol, so I pulled it from under the marsh grass and gave it to him. He held it out carefully and studied it. You're going to have to learn to shoot it, you know, I said. I will. I can set up some targets for you. What about bullets? We'll have to buy some more when we get money from things we sell. Kit gave me back the pistol. We've been out here a long time, Moon. Yeah, I said, returning the pistol to its hiding place. We've got everything we need. We should look for some medicine. I looked over at music. I don't know. Sometimes I don't feel good. I think we should have some medicine ready just in case. We've got some. We'll get some today. I knew of a place in the hillside where black willow grew, and we spent the morning pulling bark and grinding it into aspirin. We stored the medicine and the meat in the ground where it would stay dry. Nothing to worry about now, Kit. Kit smiled and it seemed like he wasn't worried anymore. That afternoon, we used a knife to scratch out patterns on the deer hide for two hats. Using twine I made from the inner bark of the cedar tree, I bound the pieces together and gave Kit the hat with the tail still attached. He wore it proudly, and we decided they were our symbols that we'd wear all the way to Alaska. One afternoon, we lay in the treetop platform watching buzzards circle us. I told Kit that if we lay there long enough, we might be able to get one to come down. Have you ever done it? No, but I've thought about it a lot. How long do we have to lie like this? We can do something else. Let's go shoot the pistol. You think it's safe now? It's been more than two weeks since we saw Sanders. I don't think he's coming back. I chose a rotten log as a target, and Kit followed me to place to a place about 20 yards back from the log and stood behind me when I inspected the gun. I thought you'd shot a gun before, I said. he said. I have. Why do you always look at it like that? Because I haven't ever shot one like this. It's an automatic and it's big. After a minute, I discovered how to slide back the top of the pistol so that it loaded a bullet from the magazine. I held it out in front of me and aimed at the log. I sucked in my breath and squeezed the trigger. The explosion threw my arms over my head and left me deaf, deaf to all but a ringing in my ears. As I brought the pistol down, I saw that I'd hit the log where I was aiming. I turned to look at Kit. He had his hands over his ears and pulled them away slowly. I've never shot anything like that, I said, barely hearing my own voice. I laughed. I can't hear anything. Did you hit it? Kit asked. Sure, I hit it. I turned back around and Kit slammed his hands in his ears again. I aimed the gun with more confidence this time and squeezed the trigger. The pistol bucked into the air. An explosion punched so deep my teeth hurt. Wood chips flew from the center of the log where I was aiming. When I turned to look at Kit, he smiled and nodded. We're going to get something big with this thing in Alaska, Kit, I yelled. 